Welcome back, everybody, to the DanJohnUniversity.com podcast, episode number 98, sneaking our way up to number 100 on your charts. Let's get started. Our first question comes from Sean, and Sean starts off with something that, uh, if you know my work, you know this will bother me, but let's get started. My question involves my son. It would have been nice for the question to come from the son. Let's go on because I think this dad is going to uh, come up with some interesting insights that I think will help us all. He is 16 and will be a junior in high school in the fall. He is six feet tall and weighs about 135 pounds, basically about 61 kilos. He plays water polo for a school team and wants to do everything he can to make the varsity team this year. Well, I sure hope he's in the pool every day practicing and swimming hard and taking care of business. The season begins in the fall, but the team has practices and plays in tournaments over the summer, and I sure hope he goes to every practice and every tournament. Tryouts will coincide with the beginning of the school year in about eight weeks. Today he asked his coach what he needs to do to make the team and was told, hit the weight room and put on some size. And all my listeners are going, why would you wait until eight weeks out to make that kind of determination? Uh, I had a good friend play for a major university. I don't want to mention the university's name because I hate it. And the head coach, who's a legend, said to him one day, I need you to put on 40 pounds and lose three-tenths of a second in your 40-yard time before fall. And the coach said to him, he told what coach told him this in about June. So he wanted him to put on 40 pounds in eight weeks and get faster. Uh, we all know what the coach was hinting at. Uh, I'm going to tell you straight up, uh, I wish you would have, we would have taken care of this earlier. I have a program made for high school kids, basically, called Mass Made Simple. We would I would have had you do this probably in January, February. Uh, it's a six-week program. You, you still have time to do this now if the podcast hits you in time. Um, and so the coach said, today he asked his coach what he needs to make the team, and he was told, hit the weight room and put on some size. Uh, mass building... Uh, combined with tournaments and water polo is going to be difficult. Uh, that's going to be a tough, a, a tough double draw here. Um, but let's continue on. Over the past year, he's been doing push, pull, hinge, squat, loaded carry workouts three times a week and running two to four miles on the other days. Wait, we're talking about mass building here. Lifting weights three days a week, good idea. Running two to four miles while mass building. Not a good idea, but wait, there's more. This is in addition to off-season water polo once a week, which I would say should have been three days a week. Oh, and Brazilian jiu-jitsu twice a week. BJJ is taking a back seat for the duration of water polo. I realize, says Sean, bailing himself out, this amounts to a herd of rabbits running in every direction, but over the lockdown, I was glad he found constructive ways to spend his time. Sean, you redeemed yourself in my eyes on that last line. Given the input from his coach, I would greatly appreciate any thoughts you have. Yeah, why is he running? Why is he doing uh, Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu? Um, yeah, I, I don't get it. He, he's six foot one thirty-five. He needs to put on weight, and he's running four miles. How does running carry over to water polo? Uh, I can see the BJJ actually, because you know water polo is a is a fighting sport, uh, from what I've seen. Uh, my high school is very good in water polo. I watched a lot of games. Uh, but yeah, uh, ideally I would get you, uh, I would have him lifting twice a week, eating every single thing in sight, uh, with the high rep squats. Uh, I would drop the running, uh, you know, you'll notice I have him drop back to two days a week. Um, I, on the days he is, uh, doing, um, his squatting, that would probably be a good day to uh, maybe practice the skill set of, of water polo. And then maybe on the recovery days, getting some long, easy uh, distance swims in uh, to, keep, to, to keep both sides. Um, yeah, this is, a, this is a classic total... Um, uh, yeah, this is, this is a wait until the last minute for me. Uh, you should have about four to six months of time to get yourself ready for uh, uh, 
get yourself used to the new mass once you build it. And of course, he only has, he'll have maybe a week or two at most, which might be fine. I mean, we always joke in American football, no one gets smaller as you compete. Uh, you might get slower, but no one gets smaller. Um, dump the running. Uh, he can run the rest of his life. I would maybe dump the BJJ. He can, he can go roll around the mats the rest of his life. Uh, he has a very narrow window for water polo. He has this season and the season after. And um, I would put all my eggs in that basket if I were him. But um, this, is a, this is one of those questions that's tough for me to answer. It would have been nice if he'd given me more time. It would have been really helpful for him to have started dealing with the mass January, February versus uh, June, July, August. But if you, worst, uh, you know, for, here's your short answer. Buy my book, Mass Made Simple follow it to the letter and then uh you know hope he puts on some weight at 130 pounds at six foot uh where he's at as a junior he might really put on a lot of weight he might break our records uh good luck to you sean and thank you for the question we have a question from sam which is a little different we have purchased our first home and i wanted to ask for some homeowner advice as a bay area guy I've never been a homeowner, never had a lawn, never really lived a Four Seasons region. Can you impart any wisdom or dad knowledge to the first-time dad and homeowner? We already have a garage gym. We built out of, we built out during COVID, so that is covered. Sam, I'm going to tell you from the heart. Um, you know, when I first moved to Utah, I'd never seen a swamp cooler before. I really never even seen an air conditioner, being from South San Francisco. I uh, didn't know about snow and uh, lawn mowing in South City is pretty easy. You mow the lawn and and then nature take, take, takes care of everything else. So what I'm going to recommend you do is this. Uh, uh, you're going to have to get, I would say, actually, you, nowadays you can do it on a computer, but I would have a monthly, uh, I would start up a monthly checklist. You're probably going to be a little bit behind all the time, but... Uh, for example, if you haven't, it, it's as I, I'm speaking here, it's in the hot months of summer. But, uh, you know, if you're in an area that's going to have snow, I would buy the snow shovel early. Uh, I would spend some good money on it. Uh, you have to make a decision whether you want to shovel snow or blow snow or um, get a really big rig and uh, plow. Uh, I don't know how much room you have, but in my house, I can do things pretty easily with just a snow shovel. Um for the for the lawn care stuff, uh, there is a company, and I can't believe I'm actually going to actually say a name. It's called E Go. It's capital E G O. I'm a big fan of their stuff. They have a lawn mower, an electric lawn mower with two little battery packs that I think is great, and they have a blower that is just amazing. Um, uh, you know, you're gonna have to learn how to weed whack and la uh, lawn care. Um, Good lawn care happens in February, March, I think. Uh, every February, March is when I, I get my lawn aerated. That's where we do the power raking. And that's when I put on the early season uh, fertilizers, including the, the, the stuff that uh, here in Utah we have something. Sometimes it's called spurge. And we also have, well, of course, we have dandelions. My thought is this. If everyone just decided to grow dandelions, everyone would have perfectly uh, green grass lawns. But when you try to gra uh, plant green grass, all you end up with is dandelions here in Utah anyway. But what I would do is I'd start, to, I would have a January list, a February list, a March list, build it up over a couple of years, maybe ask a neighbor or two what uh, what they do uh, or things to look out for. Uh, my neighbors when I f were very helpful. And just ask simple questions like, you know, what should I do? Where I live, you have to turn on, uh, you have to turn on and turn off your air conditioners, your swamp coolers. You have to transition between seasons, and if you have a little checklist, life becomes much easier. Um, uh, I put up, for example, something this simple. I put up my Christmas decorations on Thanksgiving Friday. You know, the Black Friday. I put up uh, Christmas on Black Friday. Um, I always buy. I always buy a turkey uh, months ahead of Thanksgiving. I, I do all these little things like this because once you've made a mistake once or twice, you're, you're kind of happy long-term not to do it again. So I hope that helps, Sam. Uh, home care is an ongoing daily thing. I would 
if I were you, I do a kind of a small little inspection of the home every day. Uh, I, I would check underneath your uh, any any drains you have uh, in your home. I would check. I would open up. I would open up and look underneath at least once a month. Trust me, if you if it's 30 days of dripping, you got a lot more damage. Uh, if it's only a few days of, uh, of dripping, um, I would find out where all your shutoffs uh, for everything are. Um, that's huge. Uh, I hire uh, a young man by the name of Andrew once a year to go through my house. He's a home inspector. It cost me, oh, it, it's not very expensive, maybe a couple hundred bucks now for somebody going, 100, 200 bucks, whoa. But he finds areas where, for example, the insulation has gone bad uh, on my air conditioners, the, air, the, the outdoor insulation had come off. I think I spent $2 and probably two hours insulating my air conditioner pipes going into my home and the, the the savings was notable so it is worth your time and energy to have a an additional home inspection every couple of years uh i would become I, I, I you may not live in a city like i do like murray but in murray city you can either drive down to the offices or call and you can get all kinds of really good information about the kind of trees to plant the type of grasses, uh, appropriate times to water, all those little odd things that you don't even think about. Somebody's already done the work. Uh, one other area, finally, uh, check into your public library and just see if they have any things in there for home maintenance in your particular area. Great question, question Sam. I hope it helped. And uh, five sets of two and drink water. Thank you. <laughs> oh, we got a question from Jim Bob. Okay, Jim Bob, I have a question about when one should do heavy, low rep sets for presses. I recently ran the clunkily named Soju and Tuba program for Kettlebell Press, where the work is frequent in the one to three uh, rep range and runs for 18 sessions. I made good progress on the 24K bell and by the end was able to press the 32K for reps. Well, good. Uh, my question is this, I'm still relatively new to the kettlebell press, so before another low rep cycle, would it be better to mix in some higher rep range work? Yeah, I always think that's a great idea, but you know, I, you know, your mileage may vary. Would gaining extra work capacity and hypertrophy from the plus three or even plus five range help maximize future strength gains? Yeah, I, well, I always found it was true. The nice thing about doing three sets of eight, you know, with the minute rest, is that's 24 reps, and the body seems to need some practice to train the nervous system, uh, which is like the most obvious statement I've ever made in my life. Related to this, would you recommend higher rep work for a beginner before doing low rep programming in the first place? Yeah, isn't that a given, Jim Bob? I mean, literally, that is a given in my world. Uh, we always do volume before intensity. Now, I know a lot of us, Jim Bob, don't do that anymore, and that's wrong. And I, and I don't, uh, fortunately, I grew up at a time where you you were expected to be able to do, you know, 12 to 20 reps in some of the training programs as practice, you know. Or we, were, we did a lot of time sets, you know, 45 seconds on, 15 seconds on, off kind of things. But yeah, absolutely, volume before intensity. Build the foundation before you try to build everything back up. Yeah, that is just, uh, I was about to say common sense, but uh, uh, as I'm speaking this, common sense is almost gone from the field of uh, strength and conditioning, so maybe I need to remind more people about it. It's a good question. Yes, volume is good before intensity, and if you're a new lifter, and I'm guessing because you are you're, you're you had to, to train to do the 30 too. I, I didn't mean that snarkily. Um, but yeah, you probably could use some more volume. Yes. We have a question for Kevin and it's a very simple question, but boy, there's a lot of meat in it. I am loving the strength gains that I am seeing using the Southwood program and was thinking about, so the Southwood program, uh, a set of eight, a set of six, and then a set of four with the same weight in the power clean and then the military power clean it, then military press it. And then the front squat, I recommend power clean, then front squat. And then the bench press, though, and I would say for many of us, the bench press is optional. 
I'm seeing with the Southwood program and was thinking about tackling your easy strength for Olympic lifts a few times before attempting the Big 21 program for the first time. So easy strength <laughs> for the Olympic lifts is a is a mobility sequence warm up, uh, a complex, and then uh, the Olympic snatch, the Olympic clean and jerk, and then uh, ruck, heavy hands, walk, bicycle, row for 45 minutes after before attempting the Big 21 program, which is a three-week program, nine workouts, Monday, Wednesday, Friday, where you clean and press, snatch, and clean and jerk, and you do a set of five, add weight, a set of five, add weight, a set of five, add weight, a single add weight, a single add weight, so that it adds up to 21 total reps, 15 plus six singles, where you add either uh, a kilo or two, or in, in the United States, it'd be five pounds, and and Every workout, you start five pounds, a kilo or two heavier every time, and it's really hard. So there's a lot. So let's review what I just said so you understand. I am loving the strength grains that I'm seeing with the Southwood program and was thinking about tackling your easy strength for Olympic lifts a few times uh, through before attempting the Big 21 program for the first time. Do you have any advice for a first timer? And you gave me three programs and... Um, for the easy strength for Olympic lifts, you have the courage to go light and really, really push the uh, the walking at first. And then as best as you can, remember, I want you to Olympic lift five days a week, snatch and clean and jerk. And always remember, it's tomorrow and the next day that you're thinking about. You're going to get your volume from Olympic lifting five days a week. You, you get about, you know, 10 total reps in a workout. So that's two by five, three sets of three, whatever. So at the end of each week, you know, uh, you're doing 50 snatches. Uh, if you're doing the, uh, the clean and jerk the way I do it, it would be more like 25 because I do three to five singles. And this is something I learned from Dave Turner is that the clean and jerk mentally think of that as two reps. Now you, your mileage may vary, but I thought for, uh, for most uses, that's a good way to keep things balanced. If you do do a really long, hard clean and jerk workout with lots and lots of clean and jerks, you'll notice it just, it just, it just wears you down. So the first thing I would do is if you're doing the easy strength, um, you know, never miss, enjoy the workouts and come back every day and get more weight in. And what I'm discovering is that after about two or three weeks, it's just funny how easy it is for me to snatch and clean and jerk those weights. So that's, which is of course what easy strength means for the big 21. I want you to do this. I want you to do it two times. I want you to start off the first one lighter than you even think. Now, the last time I did this, well, let me just do it, do it, do it, do it this way. The last time I can remember clearly doing this and it worked out great is that I used 225 for my press on the uh, workout number nine, last rep, 225 for my snatch, 225 last rep, and 245 for my last clean and jerk. Uh, the reason that's interesting is because when I did that, my snatch and clean and jerk and press were far above those numbers. You know, uh, I mean, probably in the snatch at the time, I was probably still snatching 260 or something like that. So uh, for my European listeners, um, you know, I, I focused on using 100 kilos even though my lifts were 120. Uh, that worked out as, as well as any, and this is a while ago, but I remember right after that uh, track season started and I was in the best throwing shape that I had been in in a long time. Uh, I got better later when I started doing the, uh, the, the lift followed by sprints, what we call lift and sprints and more loaded carries. But for where I was in my career at that time, it was the best. So start lighter than you think uh, I do, I used to have a nice little spreadsheet, I, I don't know where it is, so don't ask for it, with all nine workouts in. And basically, if you can, it's easy to do, uh, is you take a uh, workout, so you go to work, you start the numbers at workout number nine, and you plug in the last attempts, the press, the snatch, and the clean and jerk, or what your goal is. Generally, I argue the pre press and the snatch should be almost the exact same number. You know, I get it, there's changes and clean and jerk about 10 kilos, 20 pounds more. And then what you do is you just go backwards. So workout nine, you would go, uh, if you're using uh, pounds, uh, the very last rep was 225, the rep before is 220, 215, you know, 
210, 205, you know, you know, and you work it all the way down and then you slide over to workout number eight, workout number eight finished at 220, slide it over, workout number seven finished at 215 and, and fill the whole chart in. And then when you, when you get to workout number one, you're going to look at that and go, that's going to be easy. Yeah, that's easy. Workout two, I've had people look at me and go, I just don't see it. And that's the same person that can't sleep the night before workout eight. And don't forget there's workout nine coming in behind it. So I would pre-plan your numbers, go lighter than you think the first time with the experience of the first big 21, give yourself the, well, the best that the best I've ever seen anyone do was they did the big 21, three weeks, hell, three weeks of hell. Oh, I'd say they did two to from what I recall, two to four weeks maybe of just general three-day a week, whole body building, you know, take it easy. Mass made simple for the whole six-week program, a week or two D-train, and then the Big 21 again. Uh, this was for American football, but this was brilliant. Uh, on those, by the way, those bodybuilding periods, those whole three days a week, the other days uh, of the week uh, during those, those D-load, D-training periods, was working on sprint technique and uh, just some basic skill practices for American football. Kevin, I hope that helps. Um, let me know how you do on this. And if any of our gentle listeners decide to put together a spreadsheet, I will do my best to not lose it this time. Thank you. We have a question from Isaac. I recently managed to snatch the 20 kilo kettlebell 100 times in five minutes, and I can push press the 32 kilo kettlebell overhead. Okay, that's not bad. How would you go about trying to do the 20 kilo snatch 200 times in 10 minutes and strict military press the 32K overhead? Boy, you're already on the right track. You know, I, I think I've mentioned this before, but my argument for the RKC2 was that we don't have two tests for men. You had to be able to pest, uh, press the beast, which is the 48 kilo bell, and snatch the 24 uh, 200 times in 10 minutes. I love this idea. Oh, and it all had to be done in half an hour. Um, the, the, um, the problem was, uh, uh, very, very few people, uh, who were in charge could, <laughs> who wanted to have that cause they couldn't do it. I could, uh, the best program I know for this would be the rite of passage. It's from, um, uh, Pavel's book, enter the kettlebell. Um, there's probably some workout generators for it online. Uh, the best person I know to talk with this is Mike. Warren Brown. If you're at danjohnuniversity.com, if you just go to the RKC prep program, that'll probably be the best thing you can do. Uh, I like the idea that it's just the 20K 100 times and the 32, because I think those are very manageable. Here's my thought on this as I look this over, Isaac. Anybody who could snatch the 20K 100 times, uh, pardon me, 200 times in 10 minutes and press the 32, you're going to get the, uh, you know, the, the old hee-haw salute from me. That's, that's good work. Um, a few mutants uh, can do the 24 and the 48, but I, I like this. So uh, danjohnuniversity.com, go to the RKC prep program, and I don't know if I can detail it any better than that, okay? Thank you. And a good question, and I'd like to, I'd like to see you do it. Thank you. We got a question from Rob. First off, congratulations on your recent weight loss. You are looking great. <laughs> I blush. Now you are a lighter man. Well, lighter in terms of body weight, but not my scholarly application to life. Would you mind giving some insights on how you think you will, be, you will go about keeping the weight off? I had to sip a cup, cup of coffee and look off in the distance because I haven't really thought about it. Well, the first thing I'm going to do, Rob, is I'm going to, now that I'm a 102 kilo lifter, I've lifted twice in this division. Um, now I'm going to drop to 96 uh, kilos uh, for my American listeners, 211, and compete down there and hopefully keep there. Uh, the smartest thing I can do is what I'm doing. Uh, um, so basically, if you know my work, uh, in fact, I just had, you know, I'm, I'm trying to eat vegetables every meal. I'm eating fermented foods twice a day. I've cut alcohol back to almost nothing, and that's not a bad or good thing. I just it was just for my, so I can uh, dance at Josephine's wedding. She's my granddaughter. Um, you know, it's funny. It's 
The one thing I have noticed, uh, Rob, and, and, and your mileage may vary, my quality of sleep has improved a lot. Uh, that's been something. So I'm thinking, I'm thinking of not changing much. Now, obviously I had an Olympic lifting meet, so now I'm back to uh, basic bodybuilding, but we're doing it with a little bit of an asterisk. Um, so like today we did uh, original strength, TRX, and then kettlebell press. Uh, 400 to 800 meter walk, and I was holding um, five pound weights, two two and a half kilo, two kilo weights, and heavy handsing. So, original strength, TRX movement, uh, press, walk, and I think we did that seven rounds. Uh, so it's a, not, a lot of walking. Tomorrow's buns and guns, and we'll do a heavy ruck after that. Uh, so really, for me, even my bodybuilding now, the what, what I call bodybuilding, that's the press and guns and buns days, uh, is still going to have walking as the focus. Well, let's read your question. Um, so that well, so that answers number one. I am 38 years old, 170 centimeters, and currently 86k. My weight has yo-yoed over the years from extremely lean and muscular to well, not so lean and muscular. My lightest in recent years being 72K. Yeah, yeah, your height, that makes sense, yeah. And my heaviest is 94. As I'm sure you will agree, losing fat is hard, but keeping it off seems to be even harder, for me at least. No, that's absolutely true. There was a theory for a while called the set point theory. Now, whether or not the set point theory was true, I, I don't know. But it's this idea that the body wants to come back to this... Uh, you know, it's like a thermostat. You know, the body wants to just come back to that number. So it'll heat up or cool down to get you back to that flat number. Uh, fat fat seems to be a, an, a, a brilliant evolutionary answer to famine. Uh, it also has a great deal of protective qualities. Uh, it can handle a lot of toxic waste. It, it's Fat is an amazing thing. And of course, the fat is also something that um, we are now dealing with because I, I, and my thought is between the environmental factors, including here in the United States anyway, the fact that we subsidize certain foods, uh, soy, corn, wheat, uh, dairy, and there's another one I don't remember. And so they get a real break. So every food in America has that stuff in it. And then they engineer foods to be uh, that you can't stop eating them. Uh, interesting, after my weightlifting meet where I lost this weight, uh, I had some potato chips, which I hadn't had in a long time. And I just noticed I was just smashing them down my throat. And I'm like, holy cow, it is true. They, they are addictive, you know. So basically, I would argue to keep your weight down, your fat down, uh, I would think, you know, vegetables at every meal, f fermented food, you know, you know the drill. Protein, water, veggies. Uh, try to improve your sleep hygiene. What else we got here? Would you mind? Yeah. And, and, and the final question is, have you noticed any mindset sh shifts or pearls of wisdom you now live by that maybe heavier Dan John did not? No. Um, in fact, you have to remember this. My coach, Dick Notmeyer, and my coach, Ralph Mon, both agreed that my best com competition weights we're at 215 to 230. So basically uh, 97 kilos to 105 in that, in that range, 90, maybe 98 kilos. And that's where I thrived. Uh, and then I went to this place that, you know, has five rings on it here in the United States. And they told me to do a number of things. One is uh, illegal, immoral, and unethical and banned by the group with those rings. <clears throat> the other one was they wanted me to get my squat up, which didn't work out. And the third up my carbs so I could put weight on and I got up to 124 kilos which is about 273 and I felt terrible all the time the only thing I would do Scott and uh, pardon me I'm, I'm sorry uh Rob is um is I'd go back to talk to little Danny John back in the day and tell him that these guys are full of it and stick to the plan you know Olympic lift uh run hills throw the discus because that worked really well today I would uh I would probably front squat, then sprint up the hill, but that would be the only change. Um, yeah, I regret putting all that mass on. Uh, if I was an American football player, that would be one thing. But, you know, when I was, and I learned this from gr the great Utah State discus thrower, Glenn Passy, you know, you, you, 
as you're turning with a light uh, weight, which is the two kilo discus, you don't need to weigh 400 pounds. Uh, you, and, and every ounce of fat you have is dragging, you know, dragging you back a little bit. So I, I don't like giving myself advice in the past because I haven't figured out the time machine yet. <laughs> have a great day. Thanks for your question. It's very good. Thank you. We have a question from Scott. Thank you for your informative podcasts and instructional videos. You get to stay. I have a question about foot placement variation for the back squat. I am, my, I am in my 60s and prefer front squats. Good for you. Don't ask any more questions. Good for you. But I remember an article from the 1980s bodybuilding days that discussed the benefits of doing back squats with your legs together. Uh, anytime people bring up bodybuilding, especially from the 1980s, I shudder. The, the nonsense that those magazines were producing in the 80s. Uh, uh, you know, of course, you know, uh, behind me I have literally, I would say, thousands is an exaggeration, but hundreds of magazines. And it does crack me up because you will see under certain editors and publishers that they're really trending in a very, in, you know, smart, uh, intelligent, repeatable direction. And then somebody says, we need to sell some more supplements or we need to, you know, sell more to 14-year-old boys or whatever who want to get big and muscly. Uh, I, you know, you go ahead and squat with your, 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 your feet together. I've done it as a lark, uh, for a guy like me, it's just pure hell on my knees and hips. Uh, at your age, if, if, or at, at most people, if, if, if you're old enough to remember, oh, you're in your sixties. Okay. Yeah. There's no need for you to put that kind of stress on your, your knees, uh, on your, on your hips. Um, do you see any practical benefit to doing this as a squat variation? My answer would be no. But you can go ahead because I can't stop you and no one's going to try. Or is it specifically a bodybuilding technique to enhance certain areas of the quadriceps? Yeah, I don't think it had it. I, I, I'm sure it did a little bit. But, you know, I still think when you, the, you know, when you look at the Olympics and the Olympic lifters, none of those guys do any isolation work. And you look at their quads and they're just off the charts and they just do front squats. So I just don't see the need for isolation exercises for the legs. Never have. Uh, people who do isolation exercises for the legs, unless you're, if you're injured, ill, whatever, I, I get that, but put the weight on your chest or your, uh, or your, uh, or your back and do your front squats, do your overhead squats, do your back squats, and then tell me about this magic formula. Boy, I hope that helped. Thank you. Craig asked a good question. Just wondering if you've seen Ryan Krauser's new shot put world record yet. Yes, absolutely. I think I heard them say that the previous record stood for over 30 years. Yeah, absolutely right. Yeah, I've never been a throwing athlete and thought it was amazing. He started celebrating before he even stopped spinning. Uh, yeah, there is a bizarre moment in the throws where you finally get your brain out of the way. And you can see on his throw there, when he gets in this, uh, we go, the 2-3 the transition, uh, the transition between... Uh, and when he's in the middle of the ring and you can just see his upper body trailing his lower body, his lower body hits the throw and you can just see this massive bow and arrow happens with the throw. I would imagine that when that thing went off his fingertips, it, there was, even though the, the, the ball weighs 16 pounds, I bet you it felt like ounces to him because he just snapped it so perfectly. Yeah. that So, oh, okay. Uh, yeah, you can feel a great throw. Um, when I was in, at, uh, in, in college, my best throw, I was the only time in my career ever felt, uh, I felt that stretch reflex, that rubber band happen in my chest on my other great throws in my career. Very often I will finish the throw and I have to be judgment free because I wait until I either hear my family, my friends or the crowd. Because if I, I, sometimes you hear this, it takes a moment for your head to unclear. So you want to foul bad throws, but you, you, because sometimes the throw feels so effortless. You have to just stop and go. And then you hear people losing their minds and maybe that was a good throw uh, at my national championship video. I think it's on the sites. Uh, you can just see that I am, I have no reaction because I didn't realize it was that good of a throw. So yeah, I loved it. Good question. Kind of fun to have a little question like that today. Okay, listen to this name. Nim 
Rat Deep. Nimrat Deep. Good. Um, welcome to the podcast. I do Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu four to five days a week. Not good for you. In one of your videos, you mentioned how things like bear hug carries would teach you to control your breathing while exerting pressure, which hence will be helpful in grappling. Yeah, and that particular video has uh, reminded me never to ever talk about grappling again because now everyone thinks I'm an expert on that. And frankly, I don't even know the first thing about it. I don't know if I care. Could you please talk more about that idea of which exercises can be helpful in jujitsu? Yeah, I mean, I don't know. I mean, I read Frank Shamrock's book, and I think he does a lot of tumbling. Uh, they have pretty poor techniques in the clean and jerk in the book. Uh, there's, there's squatting in the book. I mean, to me, it would just be traditional exercise. It, just getting strong would be always a good idea. I mean, and just my 25 cent opinion, bear crawls and bear hug carries would be great. But I mean, what do I know? Um, I mean, I've already had someone pan what I said about bear hug carries. And, you know, I don't know why you'd ask a, fr uh, a strength coach who doesn't know anything about a sport about the sport. But uh, I mean, so I give a very, uh, <laughs> I give a, a, you know, a fairly experienced answer. And then someone came online and said, I didn't know what I was talking about. And they're right. I didn't. And I admitted that. But yeah, bear hug, uh, bear hug carries. Farmer walks for the grip. Uh, any kinds of sleds or prowlers are always a really, really good thing to do for any sport, anytime. And just the basics of weightlifting. But really, the, the best you, the best fighters, grapplers, whatever you guys call yourself this week, they're going to be the people who have been on the mat the longest uh, with the DNA and with the mindset to be good. So, <laughs> by the way, it's true about everything. Thank you for your question. Nimrat Deep. Thank you. We have a question from Cesar or Caesar. My question is related to my father. He is almost 73 years old, still active as a medical doctor. Good for him. But I can see that his health is starting to decline. Oh boy. Are you uh, trying to give medical advice to a medical doctor? But here we go, huh? Due to the pandemic and the lockdown last year, he gained some weight. Also because he quit smoking. So a medical doctor who smokes. Okay. But he has always been close to his ideal weight, so a few extra pounds is not much of an issue right now. Good point. However, what does worry me is his strength. I have recently noticed that he has trouble opening bottles, refreshments, etc. And you know, it's interesting because there is some of that research out there that talks about grip strength being one of the real indicators of, what do they call it now, health age? So there's age. You know, that's your August 28, 1957. That's my birth and this is my age is every day after that and your health age is how old you would be if you didn't know how old you were uh, were to quote satchel page um i believe his grip strength is starting to give way my father never had the time for exercise he has never gone to a gym so he has always been weak but this time it's different well, that's interesting what can i do for him i don't know I mean, obviously, my answer, we get him into the weight room, uh, have him read some of the great work of, uh, oh, that 98-year-old. He just passed away about a year or so ago, the British 98-year-old who uh, was a sprinter and a bodybuilder, and he took up weightlifting about your dad's age, and, and the quality of his life went through the roof. Um, I know that, uh, you know, you go, to, you go to a track meet, a master's track meet, and see the 73-year-olds, and... You know, the joke is always you have to minus 20 years. You have to, so at a, let's see, at a track meet, you look at the distance runners and you guess their age. And the correct answer is 20 years younger. At a master's track meet, you look at the throwers, you guess their age. And the correct answer is 20 years older. Um, yeah, I'd love to see them lift weights. Um, uh, loaded carries, any ground work, uh, any kind of hinge squat, push and pull work. But of course, the it's your it's getting them to do it is going to be the issue. Uh, machines might be extremely appropriate for what he needs. Hope that helps. Well, there you go. Thank you so much. Uh, reminder: uh, if you want all the videos, uh, join join the site danjohnuniversity.com or be a fan of ours at Patreon at Coach Dan John. And if you have questions, remember, if you have questions, I don't mind answering them. Uh, there are certain questions that kind of irritate me, and you can see that. 
but uh, uh, email them to us at podcast at danjohnuniversity.com. I'll do my best to answer each and every one. And good luck to you, and we'll see you in the weight room.